Welcome to Members First. The Toastmasters District 69 podcast. Here is your host, District Director Barbara Nielsen. Welcome everyone for today's Members First conversation. It gives me great pleasure to introduce a member from Kiwana Waters Toastmasters Club, Muriel Smith. Good afternoon, Muriel. How are you today? Hello, Barbara. I'm very well, thank you. That's good. It's the only way to be, isn't it? So I'm going to ask Muriel a few questions about her life and times with Toastmasters and outside Toastmasters. Muriel, how long have you been a Toastmaster and why do you stay? I've been with Toastmasters for nearly 35 years. I stay because of the friendships that I have made and also the opportunity to help new members grow in their Toastmasters journey. That's fabulous. And what do you think is the most beneficial aspect of Toastmasters? Being able to learn with people who are there to help you, support you when you make your mistakes and guide you as you travel through Toastmasters. Yep, thank you. And I guess over the time you've learned a lot through making a few mistakes along the way too with Toastmasters. Very much so. My husband got the message from Vernon Flood once We're here to help you. And when you make mistakes, we pick you up, we dust you off and set you on the path again. Well, that's lovely. Now, Muriel, I'm aware that you've been a volunteer for the Endeavour Foundation through your life. Would you like to tell us a little bit about that experience? My eldest son is Down syndrome. And back in that time, Endeavour was called by another name and it also had branches and I became involved with the Ipswich branch of the association, worked as a volunteer for 20 odd years, helping them raise money. So you could put your dollar up for the government to match it for us. I was a member member of the parents and friends to start with, then went on to the Ipswich branch management committee. I was a delegate to Brisbane headquarters and watch the organisation grow over the years. That's wonderful. And, you know, volunteers like you are some of the unsung heroes of our society. Going back to Toastmasters, you must have had some wonderful experiences over the years. Would you like to share a few of the maybe funny things or really special things that have happened to you through Toastmasters? When I married Laurie, he took a job managing new 10-pin bowling centres and we moved around quite a lot. I'd had the opportunity to join Toastmasters in 1973, but I'd just been recently widowed and circumstances didn't allow me to, to go. But when we were in business on Bribey Island, there was a, an ad in the local paper for a demonstration meeting. And I just said, I'm going to that. And Laurie came with me and... On the way home, he said, well, if that's what Toastmasters is all about, I'm joining with you. And he did. So we were able to travel, learn to be conference junkies, as they call us, (laughs) and spent lots of time meeting people, networking with people, and helping other people while we grew ourselves within the Toastmasters organisation. I suppose, you know, I have four distinguished Toastmaster awards, I've been area governor, division governor, and that way worked on the support team of the district top leadership and helped me grow as a person. But by gee, it helped us any time we moved to a new town. We had a Toastmasters club we could go to straight away. Yeah, that, that's wonderful. Yeah, it's like a big family, isn't it, as you travel nice. around? That's great. What would you say to someone who is considering joining Toastmasters? Go for it. It's there. You have the people to support you. You have the opportunity to develop your own skills. And if you have a career path you wish to follow, 
there's always somebody in the background who can coach you, mentor you, and physically help you settle down on your Toastmasters journey. That's great. Now, this is the, the really special question I have to ask you. As I'm part of the district leadership team this year, I'd like to know what advice you have to give to the current district leaders. It's not a tough one. It's not an easy one. But I would say be more open and aware of your members and travel as much as you can so they know who everybody is, not just us who live in the southeast corner. Thank you so much for that response, Muriel. And you know, that really is part of the rationale behind these conversations that I'm having. I've got a few more planned with, with members new and experienced. And that's the mantra I'm trying to satisfy is so that members right across the whole district get to know members across the district. And the other side of it is that members get to know the district leadership. It's been a pleasure talking to you today, Muriel, quite short and sweet, but would you like to add anything more to our conversation about Toastmasters? Toastmasters to me has been a, almost a lifelong friend. I've enjoyed meeting people. I've certainly gained in my experiences by having certain people in the background to offer me advice when I've needed it. When I joined with Caboolture, there were 24 members who knew not a thing about Tastemasters and just one person who knew what, what it was. And from that, I didn't start out with a mentor, so I very much appreciate the mentor program. And currently in my club, I'm doing the orientation of new members and then passing them on to a mentor to help them get themselves established. The Tastemasters is, is a wonderful organisation and I wish you and your team all the best for this coming year. And I hope we have a conference to come to. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Muriel. Yes, unfortunately, COVID has really put a spanner in the works, hasn't it? But yeah, you know, so. out of every adversity comes a positive if you look hard for it. You don't even have to look hard in some ways because what it's done for Toastmasters has, and I guess the whole world, is increased our use of online networking. And that's been the case with Toastmasters. We've got so many clubs that have moved online. We're having meetings and training online. And although we would love to get back to face-to-face -face meetings, we all have to face the reality of being careful, looking out for our friends and neighbors and making the most of a very difficult situation. And Muriel, it's wonderful to hear from someone so experienced as you, so much wisdom and so much to offer. I'm so glad that you're still sticking with Toastmasters and spreading your expertise to new members. Thank you so much. Thank you, Barbara. And now for the second half of our members first episode. Today, we welcome Toastmaster Paul Marangelli. Paul is a member of three clubs in Western Division. Paul has a wealth of experience and he's going to share some of those experiences with us today. So welcome, Paul. How long have you been a Toastmaster and where did you first join? Well, Barbara, I've had a, a long time with Toastmasters. I joined uh, coming up to 42 years now, come next January. Uh, my first club was in Townsville. I had newly arrived in Townsville and I joined uh, the club and stayed with them for seven years before moving to Toowoomba. And currently I'm a member of three clubs. Uh, I've been with Southern Cross Club for 35 years now and I'm also a member of the Dalby Club and one of the advanced clubs, TT Club, here in Toowoomba again. Well done. And why did you join, Paul? And more importantly, why do you stay? Well, I guess the, the reason most of us would have when we join Toastmasters is the, the fear of public speaking. 
now I'm an introvert by nature and I guess a lot of people would understand that introversion and public speaking is not necessarily a good fit. But I, I think the issue for me uh, goes a lot deeper than that. Uh, although I, I'm an introvert, I don't believe I'm a shy person as such, but I found myself when I arrived in Townsville still uh, a fairly anxious type of person. I didn't feel comfortable in my own skin. And as I was reflecting on that, I thought uh, it was probably due to the family dynamic that I was in growing up. Uh, you see, I'm an immigrant child uh, of immigrant parents and I didn't learn to speak the English language at all until I started school. So I was just under two years of age when my parents and I arrived in Australia and uh, all my preschool years were spent living on a tobacco farm uh, in the Yalabin, Texas area, which is somewhere between Gundawindi and Warwick. And so for um, that period of my life, the only language I heard was the conversations that my parents spoke, which was Italian. And uh, also there were only two other Italian families living on that farm. So it was quite isolated. If you can recall in the 1950s, there wasn't any, any broadcast radio or, or there weren't even any telephones, let alone electricity and all of those sort of things. So when I started school, I couldn't speak the language. And that sort of led to a few issues as I went through my youth, my younger years, uh, because I couldn't communicate and express my own thoughts and because I couldn't understand what other people were saying, uh, that was an issue. So I, I had the feeling that I was the odd one out, uh, that I, I didn't belong. Uh, so that, that were all those issues that crept up. But the thing that I think really caused the anxiety within me when I reached adulthood was that I was quite often undertaking a role that I didn't feel that I was entitled to or didn't deserve. So if you consider the parent-child relationship and the adult-child relationship, I found I reached a point during my primary school years where I became superior in the language to my parents and I was quite often uh, required to act as a translator um, and a go-between, so to speak, you know, with uh, town officials. Now, some of the most um, uh, difficult moments, I think, or were the embarrassing moments, even uh, perhaps in, in uh, with the doctor visits. I was mm. quite often required to translate uh, questions and provide answers of, of a delicate nature. And I mean, the English language in itself, when you think of it, is quite a complicated language uh, with, with words having so many different meanings. So for example, if we were at a, in a hospital uh, setting or a, or a doctor's room and the question was asked, when did, you, when did you last pass water? Or when did you last move your bowels? I mean, I didn't even know what a bowel was at that stage. Or, or when did you last urinate? Simple questions like that were not understood. And, uh, and I was thinking, you know, when my father was learning the language, he, he worked in labouring gangs for a long time. So the people that he mixed with were people who uh, you know, were rough in their, their language. And a lot of the language he learned was the local idioms and slang. So I recall at one stage a nurse just saying, <laughs> Mr. Marangeli, I'm just asking you, when did you last have a piss? And, and, and that was a sort of difficulty that I encountered with the language and my parents encountered. So when I reached the adulthood, I found myself still feeling a little bit uncomfortable, feeling that I was an undertaking a role that I was not worthy of, that, that I didn't feel I, I deserved to be taking a superior role when I, I felt I should not or I should be the subordinate in the relationship. And that led to sort of anxiety issues and a reluctance to feel as though I would be exposing myself by speaking in public. I'm thinking some people might refer to it as an imposter syndrome, where you feel as though you don't deserve to be performing uh, as people might be expecting you to be and that sort of thing. So that's why I joined Toastmasters. I'm sorry, that was a pretty long explanation. So 
So uh, when I arrived in Townsville, I undertook a Speaking with Confidence course. I'd spent four and a half years at that stage working for the Department of Main Roads uh, in outback Queensland. And I discovered then that I, I needed to improve my confidence level. So I did a Speaking with Confidence course. The presenter of that was a Toastmaster who introduced me to Toastmasters. So come the beginning of 1979, I joined the Townsville Club and I haven't looked since. Looked back since. Now, why I've stayed in Toastmasters? Well, I think uh, when you think about the, um, the reasons we join, it's, it's self-improvement, sure, but what's kept me in Toastmasters basically are the people. When you think of the organisation that we're a part of and the culture that we have, and that culture being all about people helping other people, we very soon discover the, um, the capacity we have to make some really strong friendships. Uh, I've always felt supported and inspired by the people I've met, and that hasn't diminished at all over the past 40 years, and I still get a lot of pleasure and a lot of inspiration from the people that I, I deal with uh, and mix with uh, even today. Thank you so much, Paul. You know, that was an incredible story. And it's something for someone like me who grew up, it was born and bred, grew up in Australia, only speaking English. I do remember the migrant populations in the 50s and we have them today, but you know, it's an understanding of what it was like for you that we miss out on. So thank you so much for that in-depth answer. Now, going back to your Toastmasters experience, during your time as a Toastmaster, you've held many club officer roles. Tell us about your experiences as a club officer in a Toastmasters club. Well, I've held the club officer role uh, every year that I've been an active Toastmaster. There's only a four year period in the early 90s that I, I was inactive. And that was because of some family responsibilities and roles I had with school um, bodies and, um, and associations. But I've held all the club officer positions. I've been president five times. So I've held two successive terms as an area governor. But um, what I found was that my strengths lay mainly in the administration area. I'm not a natural frontline type of person. I feel more comfortable acting in supportive roles and, and that's, that's where my strengths lie. Although having said that, although uh, my strengths do lie in administration, I found that the skills and the confidence that I developed over the years as part of my Toastmasters membership enabled me to actually carry out a few leadership roles uh, quite well, uh, which really was a, would have been a surprise to me 40 years ago. So uh, that stood me in good stead. That's wonderful, Paul. That's great. Now, in your career with the Department of Main Roads, you spend a lot of time living in the Outback Queen, in Outback Queensland. So tell us a few of the highlights of that part of your life. Well, I spent four and a half years working in outback Queensland, uh, again, working with main, the main roads department. So I did have an opportunity to travel uh, quite extensively in that part of the world. And I do, do acknowledge, you know, what a privilege it was actually to be spending time living in places that were were rich in Australian history. And I'm talking about Aboriginal history as well as recent white history. For instance, uh, I spent two years living in Winton and Winton was where uh, Qantas was set up uh, and uh, Qantas was, uh, was founded in, Quinton, in Winton. And uh, Winton's also close by to the Combo Waterholes where Van Joe Patterson wrote the uh, song Walsing Matilda. So there's a lot of history out there. I found during my time out there that although I spent lots of periods of time where I was, I was on my own, uh, I was never lonely. I was lonesome, yes, but never ever lonely because the people out there are so friendly. So I had a, a quite an enjoyable experience uh, spending my time at West. 
And there are a lot of memorable experiences that I had that I would not have otherwise experienced. I mean, it's it's uh, and quite an experience being stranded out in the middle of nowhere because you're bogged on a black soil plain uh, uh, as a result of the storm uh, and not being able to get out for a night or two or three at times. I remember at one stage um, flying into Birdsville with the local consultant who um, were looking after roadworks right throughout, throughout all of those shires, Diamantina Shire in particular and Border Shire. So one, um, one uh, period of time we flew into Birdsville expecting to be there just for the day, but because we, we had rain that afternoon, we couldn't taxi the aircraft onto the runway, which was to the gravel runway back in those days. So we had an overnight in Birdsville, which when you think about it, was quite an experience because here I was enjoying that, um, whereas a lot of tourists pay thousands of dollars to do that. So I felt quite privileged in that sense as well. And there are other aspects of outback life which were unique uh, back in the 1970s when there's no um, reticulated power supply or state, from the statewide grid. Every town had their own power supply. There's no television. All the telephone lines were operated through a telephone exchange and a lot of properties operated on what we call party lines. So everybody could listen in on the conversations if they wanted to. Um, but the... The thing that, <clears throat> the experience that I I found quite surreal was when Colour TV arrived in Australia, that was the 1st of March, 1975, uh, I had already experienced living uh, in that part of the world without any television, very little broadcast radio. And we went from having no TV straight to having Colour TV and, and that, brought about a dramatic change in the social lifestyle of the town. But I've got to say it only lasted for about three months before we went back to making our own fun. <laughs> yeah, thanks so much for that, Paul. That, that actually brings back a lot of memories for me about living in the outback, black soil plains and party lines. Yeah, it's something that people in the city probably don't understand, but well done. Thank you. Now, you talk to me about the value of understanding correct meeting procedure. So can you tell us some of your experiences inside Toastmasters and outside Toastmasters where correct meeting procedure has been important? Yes, Barbara, I, I had, um, I, I've been very fortunate. I had a, a long 40 year career with uh, the main race department, which is now called the DTMR. Uh, and I, I needed to get involved with quite a few formal meetings throughout my career. Uh, quite often we would have public consultations where we'd need to discuss um, roadworks or options or, or realignments or resumptions, that sort of thing with the general public. So they needed to be formalised. So a good knowledge of meeting procedure was, was essential in those contexts. But I was also quite active in my social life, uh, I, I held many secretary treasurer type of roles with organisations such as the uh, parents and friends committees, uh, sporting clubs, uh, I was a member of uh, amateur theatre groups uh, in Townsville, I was a member of the Townsville Coralton Orchestral Society and uh, we all I got involved in the administrative area as well on those sort of committees. I think the biggest challenge that um, I noticed with meeting procedure, and this is you know, both professionally and also in a social context, was the, 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 um, the challenge of the getting to understand the terminology, the correct terminology. For instance, um, you know, do we pass or a motion or carry? Do we, do we receive a report or do we adopt a report? Do we accept minutes or do we confirm the minutes? Um, you know, what's the difference between the right to speak and the right of reply and, and those sort of things? And the training that I had during uh, my Toastmaster experiences, chairing meetings and listening to clubs uh, proceed through the meetings and also at the higher levels at area conferences and even the district conferences, uh, 
you know, provided me with a lot of knowledge about you know, understanding correct meeting procedure. That's, that's good. It, it's something that a lot of clubs don't place as much importance on, but other clubs that most certainly do, and we all need to understand it so much. Now, we've talked a lot about your experience as Toastmasters, but is there a particular highlight of your time as a Toastmaster? Well, I've attended many district conventions and the most uh, significant ones for me were the two that I was involved in on the organising committees. When I joined Townsville in 1979, I was immediately elected to the treasurer role, which meant that when we had our convention in 1980, I was a treasurer and registrar for that convention. And it was a particularly influential experience for me because we had two things happen. One was that the international president of the time, uh, Eric Stuhlmuller, uh, was present at that convention. And I remember being uh, so in awe of the fact that I was actually spending time in the company of, of people uh, at his level, you know, at an international level let alone a local level, but also spending time in the company of a lot of uh, inspirational people within the organisation too. But I also was given the task of presenting the evaluation contest speech, which was something I never envisaged I'd be able to do. So that for me was a particular highlight. And I think um, if I could just share something with you, um, uh, one of the things that I treasure most in my Toastmasters is a letter that I received from one Colin McFarlane, who was uh, at that stage the lieutenant, educational lieutenant governor, I think the term was back then. And he actually sent me a letter. I don't know whether you can see that, but can you see the letterhead? Yeah. That yep. was the old Toastmaster letterhead. And he sent me a lovely letter thanking me for undertaking that particular role. And, and that's something that I've treasured ever since. I mean, the fact that I, I felt uh, supported and acknowledged and that, uh, that people believed in me at that particular stage of my Toastmasters career at a time when I, I had less belief in myself was so important and so influential on me at that particular stage of my career. So that was, possibly the best highlight that I had, uh, but there've been many highlights since. And in fact, I, I really consider walking out of Toastmasters club meeting to be a highlight because I always walk out of a meeting feeling so glad that I, I went, even on those nights when I'd rather stay home falling asleep in front of the TV. Yeah, well done. Thank you so much for that, Paul. And you know, there's a strong message in that story that you just told, the importance and value of recognising and acknowledging people's contribution and the personal touch. So thank you. That's a message for us all to take note of. Now, what advice would you give to someone today who is considering joining Toastmasters? Well, I would tell them that Toastmasters are just ordinary people. Uh, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what role you have in life, uh, what status you have, uh, but they're ordinary people just like you and just like me. And we all have the same challenges in life. And the thing that I like best about Toastmasters and what they would find within the organisation is that uh, they will find a very supportive organisation that will help them to uh, work through their issues and provide them with all the encouragement that they need. And along the way, they make some fabulous friends out of it. So I'd, I'd, I'd encourage them to join and just try it. Yeah, thank you so much for that. A lot of ordinary people doing extraordinary things, isn't there? Yep. Now, the last question today is what advice would you give to the current district leadership? I don't know that I could offer any advice as such, but one of the things that I've learned in my time as a Toastmaster, but also my professional life was that relationships are everything. 
And if there's anything that Toastmasters promotes, it's the, uh, the importance of good relationships. And a lot of that, of course, is dependent on having good communication skills as well. I've seen a lot of inspirational leaders in my time within the Toastmasters organisation. Uh, I've seen the dedication and the commitment that our leadership team brings to the organisation. And all I'd like to say to the district leadership team is, look, know that you're very much valued by the membership as well, because we, we really see the hard work and the commitment that the district leadership team makes. So know you're valued and, and know that your work is very, very much appreciated. Thank you so much for that, Paul. It has been my absolute pleasure to talk to you today. And you epitomise the whole um, purpose behind this project, to get to know the members across the district. And I really appreciate everything you've had to say today, and I'm yeah. sure our members will. So that's it for today's Members First interview. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you for tuning in to Members First. We hope you enjoyed the show and will return again in the future. Bye for now.